I want to say thank you for giving me a week off last week, and it was, it was really a good week. Um, I accomplished just about everything I wanted to do. That's because I didn't want to accomplish anything. <laughs> but no, it was an awesome week in South Carolina. Um, the first five days were just beautiful, 80 degrees. Um, Wednesday, it turned kind of cold and 50 degrees and a little nasty. Um, so we just took a nice ride in the car, went up the coast a ways, and then Thursday, it just rained, poured cats and dogs down there. And um, it was quite cold. And uh, quite honestly, I didn't get out of my jogging suit till 4.30 in the afternoon. I just laid on the couch and read a book. I think Lisa thought I was dying down there or something. Because I don't get that opportunity. But you know what? It was so good. And I say thank you. for. Th there were three things that I really accomplished. One was I got to spend some really good time with my wife. The previous vacations that we've had this year, or trips, I should say, have all had aggressive agendas. A lot of it was international travel and so forth. And even when we've gone, there's been agendas and there have been schedules and there have been other people with us. But we had a week to just relax. So I got in touch with my wife. The second thing is, and I realized, and this is confession for me, as a pastor, I don't spend enough time doing what's always important. It's easy to get so caught up in trying to help others and make services work and, and so forth. that You know what? I realized that last week was a true gift because I got to spend some good time with God. There's just something about spending good time with God and not letting the busyness of the crazy demands of His world stand in the way. But that was just a gift. And third was I got to get in touch with myself. Now what do I mean by that? I've been looking at this men's Bible study of significance but I did a lot of reflecting last week and I wrote some things down and I thought, what does God want me to do with the next 10 years of my life? What does God really want me to do with the next 10 years of my life that are going to make a difference in your lives and the lives of everybody around me? And that was rich. That was rich. I've got a long list that came back with. I don't know how much of that I'm going to accomplish it, but I'm going to work on it because I believe that God wants every one of us to accomplish a certain number of things while we're on this earth. That leads nicely into where I'm going with our message this week and next week. And that's really about what happens when we leave this earth. What happens every week when you come into this place? I welcome you home. From the very first day back in 09, August 23rd of 09 to be specific, when you walk through the doors, I said, welcome home. And we say that every single morning when you come in here. And I say that because I mean it. I want you to be welcomed home. I want you to feel that this is your home. It's my desire. It's the church's desire that every week you be refreshed and you be renewed and, and that you feel encouraged and that you feel accepted, and that you feel loved, that we live up to that vision. Those aren't just words on a wall, but those are really the cry of our hearts. And we do everything we can to make that happen. From the time you walk in the door and you're greeted to the bagels and the donuts and the fruit and the juice and fresh apple cider this morning. and All these things are just little ways to show our love for you and to show our love for Christ. And then when we leave here, I hope that the place you go home to is home sweet home. I hope that your home is a place where you feel safe and feel loved and encouraged. There's something about being home, isn't there? There's just something comfortable about being home. When I got home Friday night, got this, it was a wonderful vacation, but there's nothing like crawling in my own bed when I get home. There's just some comfort in that. Whether it's church or our homes, I think that all of us would agree that we spend a lot of time planning for at home. Maybe it's meal planning. Maybe it's how we're taking care of our house. Maybe it's renovations for our house. Maybe it's future plans for what our retirement looks like. Right? We spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to be at home. Don't we? Do you follow what I'm saying with that? To feel comfortable and to feel at home in life, this place we live in, this environment we live in that we call home, we do a lot of time planning to make home feel like home so that it is home sweet home. I just talked about goals. I think those are good. I think goals and I think planning is good. I don't think they're a bad thing at all. But here's my question this morning. How much planning or goal setting do you do for when you leave this home? How much planning or goal setting do you do 
for when this life here at home ends. Do you ever think about the day when life at home stops? Kind of a crass example. You don't see too many pinball machines around anymore. But years ago, you'd go in places and there'd be pinball machines, right? The little flippers and the ball thing, right? And you'd watch the score, bing, 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 bing boom, boom, all, you know, right? huh? And then all of a sudden, bah! game over. If you were lucky, maybe you got another ball. Most of the time you didn't, right? But you got the score. How did you do? Do you ever wonder what it's going to be like? Can I just say when game is over? And I'm not calling life a game. There is the game of life. And life may appear like a game. Don't misunderstand me on that. But what I'm getting at is, do you ever think about the day when it's over and you stand before the door of heaven and your creator greets you? How much time do you think about that? We spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on in this life, but I suspect that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what that day is going to look like when we stand face to face with the one who created us. So this week and next week, we're going to take a look at that. This morning, we're going to take a look at standing in front of the door, okay, when our creator meets us. And next week, we're going to look at beyond the door. When the door opens. Are you with me? This is serious stuff. This is eternal stuff. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to minimize or underestimate or take too lightly the seriousness of this, this teaching this morning. Because one day it is going to end. As my dad would say, there's two things that are guaranteed in life. Death and taxes. We're not going to talk about taxes. But I want us to look at Scripture this morning. I want us to look at Scripture. And everything I share with you this morning is coming directly out of Scripture. Scripture backs up everything I'm going to share this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you're using version, I'm really going to challenge you to highlight or circle or whatever, or at least take out a piece of notepaper and write some of these things down and go back and reflect on them. I hope that God, my prayer is that God speaks much louder to you this morning than I do. But let's pray so that that happens. Father, we just come to you before we look at your word this morning and help us to just realize, to get pictures of what that day is going to look like so that we can live this day in preparation for that day. Speak to us, God, this morning through your word and my words. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want to start this morning by looking at uh, some words of the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. And if you were to look at the context of this, in chapter 3, it says the priceless value of knowing Christ. Just the caption over that says something. The priceless. You can't put a price tag on the value of knowing Christ. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul talks about safeguarding your faith. Do you hear that? She's like, safeguarding your faith, protecting the faith that you have. Now, we could talk about that a lot this morning because you know who wants to take that faith away from you, don't you? You know who your number one enemy is. And Paul says, hang on to what you have. Safeguard what you have. That's verse 1. Then, in verse 3, he starts out with, um, actually, 3 verses 12 through 21, it says, pressing towards the goal. Remember I just talked about goals? As Christians, there's got to be goals. Pressing towards the goals. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. I'm not there yet, Paul says, but hang on to what you have. Don't lose what you have, but make sure you're on the journey and pressing toward what's ahead. Hang on to that. Don't lose it. Don't let anybody or anything in this world snatch that or take that away from you. If you were to look at that whole chapter in context, he says, hang on to it because somebody wants to take it away. You're not there yet, but you've got to make sure you're on the journey. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it yet. But I focus on one thing. 
forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting all of that. I'm thinking about what lies ahead, Paul says. But we must hold on to the progress we've already made. That goes right back to verse 1, safeguarding the faith. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your life after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. That's serious stuff, isn't it? He's writing this to the church. Their God is their appetite. In other words, the things of this world are what they're consumed with. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But we, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. Peterson in the message paraphrases it this way. He says, but there's far more to life for us. We're citizens of high heaven and we are eagerly awaiting a savior for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies. Think about what's on the others. Think about what that just said. He's going to take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into something glorious on the other side. Do you know what's going to happen when you walk through that door one day? This is going to be gone. I'm not going to worry about a diet. I'm going to enjoy the food of this earth, though, but now time, right? But the aches and the pains and the problems of this world are going to be gone when the Christian walks through the doors. Do you ever think about the transformation that's going to take place? You talk about complete makeover. HGTV needs to get a hold of that one. Move that door. Do you see what Paul is saying? I had a whole week to think about this. You got to get a picture of that in your minds. He says he's going to change them into glorious bodies like his, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. I want you to think about that day, but think about what happens when you're standing at the door. Paul, Romans 14, 10 says this, remember. I think if Paul were here, Paul would say, get this people, get this, don't miss this, you got to get this. He said, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. We're not going to stand before Judge Judy. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of God. Romans 14, 12, a couple of verses later, Paul says it again. He says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Think about that. You and I are going to have to give a personal account to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. It doesn't say some of us. It says all of us. And then it says, we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Do you get a picture of what's going to happen when we stand in front of that door? There's going to be a judgment day, isn't there? The reality is there's going to be a judgment day. It says we're going to be judged according to the good or bad we've done while we've been in this body. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty sobering. Pretty somber. Pretty serious. It tells me that every single day of my life matters. And not only does every single day of my life matter, but everything I do every single day matters. Because God's keeping track. What are we going to be judged on? I'm going to give you five things this morning that I think we're going to be judged on. Number one is this, relationship. Our relationship with God. God wants a relationship with us. Not a Santa, but a Savior. See, if we come knocking on heaven's door every time we need something, say, God, I need you to heal me. God, I need, I need this. God, I need that. 
that's more like Santa than a Savior, isn't it? God wants a relationship where He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Huh? He wants a relationship where we're in communion with Him, where we abide with Him. You know, when you look at the New Testament, I, I, love, I love the agrarian, the ag- agricultural um, pictures that, that Jesus uses in His parables about, about vines and branches. And I, I think of grapes. And, you know, when you take a grape off the vine, <laughs> it just shrivels up and turns into a raisin. Huh? And sometimes a pretty ugly raisin. I mean, we came home to grapes in a refrigerator that didn't look as good as before we left, right? Well, that's kind of what happens to us if we're not plugged into the vine. But you know what? The grape doesn't do a whole lot when it's on the vine, does it? It just abides. Huh? And that's what, that's what God wants with us, just to abide. Abide with me. Just, just stay in my, in my strength. Just stay in, in, in my being. He wants this relationship with us. Jesus in the New Testament too, in the Gospels, um, talks about the, the shepherd and the sheep, and the sheep know his voice. Uh, let me just say, if, if God, if Jesus spoke to you today, do you know his voice? He says, I, I know my sheep, I call them my name. They know me when I call. Do you know him when he calls you? Or what does he have to do to get your attention? Do you really know the shepherd's voice? This is serious stuff. A relationship. John 10, 13 says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Verse 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Then he says, I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. We're going to have an accountability for our relationship. Convenience or commitment. Number two is discipleship. All of these end with ship, by the way. I worked hard to find that. Discipleship. That's the intentional time that we spend. You know, Jesus, when he called the followers, he said, come and, come and, when he called, when he called those fishermen, you know, people like us, just ordinary people. When he said, I want you to follow me, I'm giving you the privilege and the opportunity to come and follow me and do the things that I'm doing and you can do them after I leave. Do you believe that you can do some of the same things that Jesus did? Do you believe you can make some of the same differences He did? That's what He promised us. We need to grab hold of that. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and you'll do even greater things than I've done. That's what disciples do. But to be a disciple, you have to follow. You have to follow the master to be a disciple. What does discipleship look like? I think we're going to be held accountable for that. Discipleship is a commitment, isn't it? To go deeper and to follow more closely. I read a quote this past week, and it says, if you are simply showing up at church, dropping some money in the offering plate, that's a good habit. But if that's all there is to your commitment, you've missed the mark. Ouch. The fact is there's a cost to being a disciple. Look at Mark 8.34. It says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. Okay? Those who were following him. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? I think we're going to be held accountable for our degree of discipleship. Three is stewardship. This is about giving ourselves away. Time, talent, and treasure. Ephesians 2 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And then verse 10, and this is so important. This is what being a part of this church is about. This is, a, this is what being a part of Christ church is about. The New Testament church. This is it. It says, for we are God's workmanship. Who created us? God, we're his workmanship, right? Did he create us just to sit around and be fat and happy and comfortable? says, no, he created us in Christ to do what? To do good works. 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. I could go on and on and on about this, but think about the spiritual gifts that God's given us. Every one of us, he's given us spiritual gifts to make a difference. He's equipped us to do these good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. If you really look at that, what, the, what Paul is saying is, God is saying, I've made you to make a difference. What difference are you making? That's what I asked myself last week. Later, what difference are you making? What are you going to do with the next 10 years of your life that are going to make a significant difference in somebody else's life? How are you going to give yourself away? See, I don't want to go to my grave having God's list of things for me to do undone. Because when I get there, He's going to reveal to me what I was supposed to do. I need to hear his voice and listen to his voice so that I can do what he wants me to do so when I get here, he can say to me, well done. We're not done yet, Paul was saying. That's why he's saying pressing toward the goal. We're not there yet. This is so contrary to the American concept of life, isn't it? Maybe this is why I love Corinto Honduras. Because those people understand it more than I understand it. Because they are just sitting at the feet of God every night for worship and they could care less how long it takes. They don't care if we eat at 10 o'clock at night. I do, but they don't. They had me preach like three times when I was down there. We got a video this past week. We'll probably share it with you in the next week or so from the people down there. So eager for us to come down there. I mean, those services at night, I mean, I'm like, can I preach pretty soon? Because I can't see my notes. It's getting dark out and I'm kind of following the sun like this, right? But what they're teaching me is how to worship. They're teaching me that it's not about the stuff. It's about heaven. Discipleship. Using our gifts, spiritual gifts, physical gifts, mental gifts, financial gifts. We're going to be held accountable. I think it's kind of like a bank. When I go to the bank and I put money in the bank, when I go back to the bank, they're accountable for my money. What do you do with my money? Right? That's kind of God gives us these deposits of gifts. He says, what do you do with the gifts I gave you? Luke 12, 48 says this, when someone has been given much, I know I've been given much much will be required. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. We're going to be responsible for our stewardship. Number four, fellowship. And this is more than just hanging out and doing life. Fellowship. The Greek word here is koinonia. Some of you probably have heard that word. It's fellowship with participation. It's fellowship with engagement. Romans 12 verse 4 says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's bodies. We are many of Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. What does that mean? It says, In His grace, He's given us different gifts for doing certain things well. You have a gift that the person sitting next to you needs. Do you ever think about that? That's how a church functions. Everybody doing its part. It's just like the body. When everything's working right, man, it's a magnificent thing. But you know as well as I do, when something isn't working right in your body, it's not a good... It's the same thing in the church, right? When everybody takes a part, when everybody pitches in, when everybody works towards the goal, it functions well. And Paul says, you are the body of Christ. We're going to be held accountable for our active engagement in that body. Number five is worship. Now, some of you may say, whoa, wait a minute. Aren't all of these worship? Yes, they are. All of these things are acts of worship. But let me move on. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifices. The Old Testament was filled with sacrifices, weren't they? 
filled with sacrifices. Those sacrifices were burned up. I think the problem today, even for me, is I like to crawl off the altar. (laughs) We sacrifice to a point, but then we want to crawl off the altar. And it's saying, give yourself as a complete sacrifice. The one who gives up his life finds it. Paul says, this is your spiritual act of worship, holy and pleasing to God. A living sacrifice, giving yourself away, standing before God. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? We're going to have to give an account of our relationship, our discipleship, our stewardship, our fellowship, and our worship. I'm going to add one more, then I want to close with a challenge. Another one is forgiveness. Didn't end with a ship. Forgiveness ship. We'll add that one, okay? Forgiveness. I think this is so important. And it's so incredibly hard to do, especially when you've been hurt. But it says in Matthew 6, If you forgive those who sinned against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you refuse to forgive others, your Father won't forgive your sins either. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. If you really put all of these things together, what does it mean? If you're to walk out of here with one thing, let me come back to that. We were sitting in the counter of a restaurant, so to speak, on Thursday night, and there were three gentlemen who walked in there. And I asked them what they were doing. And one guy says, how'd you golf today? And I said, didn't do well. Really? I never went out. I'm not a golfer. You don't, they won't let me on those courses down there. I really don't think, they, they, if I got two holes in, they'd kick me out. They really would. I said, we didn't golf. We're just down here to have fun. Just down here for a week of relaxation. Well, he was waiting for two other people that were coming in from the airport. Second guy came in. We met him. Third guy came in. Sat down and Found out these were all big, big, big guys in pharmacy companies. They were executives, right? And they're down there on their golf trip. And the gentleman next to me starts telling me what happened with his daughter and his kids. And I mean, every, everywhere we went, it was like a ministry opportunity. It was rich. And then he says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm not exactly a pharmaceutical guy, but I sure take a lot of meds, you know. And I just said, I'm a pastor. And he just started talking. And he wanted to know about the church. And, uh, he, you know, he had talked about how he was in church as a kid. And he says, you need to talk to my wife. My wife is still interested in the church. And uh, anyway, I sent him an email yesterday. I promised I'd follow up. And I, and I did. But at any rate, he just said, tell me about your church. And I just said, you know what my church, the goal, the goal of my church is? It's just to love people. When I look at all five of these things that I just shared with you, when Jesus was asked in Matthew 22 by the, by the religious elite of the day, what's the most important thing of all? And Jesus said, you guys, just get this right. And you know what he told them. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what I think God's really going to ask us when we get to heaven that day? How well did you love me? How well did you love me? Did you love me with all? Capital A, capital L, capital L. Underlined, bolded, italicized, red print. Did you love me with all? Not just a little bit. Not just a little part. What did your living sacrifice look like? Did you give me everything? And then did you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? Five things, two things, one thing. It comes down to obedience. If you love me, Obey my commandments. Are you 
with me? Are you with me? It's sobering, but it's energizing. It's challenging. It's life changing. You and I have a purpose. While you and I have given a, are given another day of life and breath, we are given another day to get it right and give it all to God. My challenge is in whether you have one day left, a hundred days, or forty years, or however many, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that you love your neighbors in ways that they wonder, what's wrong with them, people? They're just too nice. They're after something. Yeah, they are. They're after heaven. And I want to take you with me. And take them with you. So that when we get there that day, what a day that will be. When my Jesus, I will see. When I look upon the face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me back here to that promised land, what a day. Huh? Glorious day. That's going to be. Amen? Let's pray. God, thanks for giving us a picture this morning.